That's a beautiful song with just the right words for this uh, reading. Um, you almost think that the hymn writer was looking exactly at these words we're about to look at because um, Jesus confronts a lot of things that we just heard in that song, um, like anxiety and fear, uh, uh, the future, whether we're prepared <laughs> for any day, let alone that day that we're gonna meet him again. And um, my prayer is that your heart is comforted by these words. I'm gonna tell you the story of a time I was probably early on in my driving career. I got my license when I was 18. And I don't know if my parents just wanted me to. I didn't need a car until then, but it's cheaper insurance for a young man to wait until 18. And uh, one of the first cars that I ever owned, well, I'm sorry, I didn't own, I'll tell you the story of it. The first cars I ever drove was a gray silver Pontiac 2000 Grand Am with the spoiler on the back. Man, it was, it was four door sedan. I was hot stuff. I mean, I could pick up friends during college and I could be their ride and it looked good. It wasn't a trashy car at all. And I thought I was all right. Anyhow, um, I used that car. Uh, it wasn't my own. It was actually my sister's and my brother-in-law's. They had just bought it and they moved for a while to the Czech Republic. And so they said, Danny, you can drive our car. I was like, sweet, all right. No car payments. I can just borrow this car and drive around for about a year. And I did. The car got me to work in the summertime. My roof house is in a town, Mankato, 40 miles away or so. And that took me there and back every, every day for my commute. Uh, weekends, I did whatever 18, 19 year olds do on weekends. Uh, during the school year, like I said, it was a popular vehicle to get people around in that frigid cold weather. Uh, heat blew nice and hot and the air AC blew great. And then one day, um, all of a sudden, out of the blue, white smoke <sighs> coming out of the exhaust. And the thing was not running well at all. It was bad. And I had to pull over and limped <laughs> along into the car shop in town, dropped it off, waited for a phone call got the phone call later that day, blown head gasket. I said, what caused that? The mechanic said, sir, when was the last time you changed the oil? Oil change? Yeah, I've heard of those before. Isn't that something your dad does for all the cars every year or so, right? <laughs> my car mechanic was in first service and I'm embarrassed to say he knows I don't know cars very well and I didn't know the first thing about maintaining a car but I knew about driving them oh did I mention it wasn't my car <laughs> that was a costly bill I mean if you know what a head gasket is you basically have to take apart the whole engine from what I understood unless this guy was taking me for a ride and put it back together so it was like buying a new engine the cost of it but it all could have been avoided had I done what? Change the oil. This thing that takes like probably 20 minutes to do and costs 30 bucks for that kind of car back then. So simple, so easy. But what had I done? I had gotten caught up in the urgent and I forgot about the important. I had gotten caught up in the speed of life and going to work, going to school and the important thing gets neglected. I'm afraid that today in our culture, that we often live in the urgent and we forget about the important. Can you think of some urgent things going on in your life right now that gotta get done today or yesterday or last week and you still have to do it? We run around and uh, we're consumed by, uh, maybe it's our kids' sports or our kids' school or maybe it's our career or maybe it's making that deadline for work or, or whatever it is that we get busy with. And it's almost like, and I've felt this way too before, you get suffocated and you feel like you can't breathe because of the urgency of the situation. And then all of a sudden when the crisis really hits, white smoke of life. What will you do then? Jesus' answer is this. He says, put the important things first, the last things that maybe are on your mind, the things that you might put off because you take them for granted so often, and he knows that we do because we're sinners. You are a redeemed child of God, forgiven by your Savior, Jesus. That's the big thing about life. That's the big important thing. But we have spiritual amnesia all the time. The big thing is, is that we're gonna meet our make maker someday. And that maker, 
We're going to be accountable for who we are and what we do. That's the big thing in life. And Jesus says, you know what? If you actually stop always worrying about the urgent and you take care of the important, if you take care of those spiritual things, your soul, not only will you be prepared for that day, that very important day that you meet God, but you will be prepared each and every day to look at life having a big Jesus, a big Savior, and the problems in life, they won't go away necessarily, but they will be a lot more manageable because you have peace, that you have a God who's taking care of you, and that loves you. So he won't let anything in this world really overwhelm you to the point of the worst. All right, so this is the setting in Luke. Jesus is about in the middle of his ministry right now in this area, and he's, he's coming to us. He's saying, you don't need to be fixed. Just, you need to be flipped. <laughs> you know, your whole priorities need to change. Jesus isn't just an add-on to our life. He is somebody that, that upsets our life to the point that we were dead in our sin and we're raised to life again in him. And Jesus is saying, with that new life that you have, you're going to be putting the important things, the spiritual things, over the temporary things. Like I said earlier in our first reading, uh, like that purse that has holes in it. This is uh, the words from Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. All right, first thing you notice is that Jesus tells you and me, he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Um, I once knew a man that uh, built a very successful business. In fact, he, he was doing quite well. And that business that he built literally went up in smoke overnight. It burned down completely, all of his inventory and everything. True story. He came out of that. Nobody was injured, thank God. And you know what his response was to it all? Well, of course he was upset. I mean, who wouldn't be? But he said, but Jesus is still my savior. <laughs> Wow, that's probably not how I would respond first to knowing me, I, but he said, but Jesus is still my savior. You can't take that away, no fire can take that away. He had a big Jesus in his life, a big savior that was bigger than the fire, that was bigger than his business, that was bigger, you know what? He had his treasure where his heart was and his treasure was a life forever with Jesus. And that put in perspective his life here on earth. So that fear, although that's a real situation that he went through, a real, a huge loss in his life, one of the biggest in his life, he still had sanity, he still had a savior, he still had peace about him amid all of the chaos that happens to him. I don't know if it's a fire in your life right now. I don't know what it is that could be causing anxiety. There's so many different things. The sermon would go on and on and on with examples. Um, but your Savior comes to you and he says, do not be afraid. Why? Because you are his little flock. What comes to mind? Answer, what comes to mind when you hear little flock? Sheep. Okay. Sheep need a what? They need a leader. <laughs> you know, every time Jesus uses this word sheep, it's like, it is cute, don't get me wrong, but it's kind of like a subtle little dig because sheep, they are kind of stubborn and they need leadership. And Jesus is saying, listen, you people that really get it, you're the people that know that you need leadership in your life and you need the best leadership. And he tells you, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd to not just takes care of you and makes sure that you have a table set in the presence of your enemies, but your good shepherd also gives his life to you, which Jesus did on the cross. Good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And here's the other beautiful thing. The good shepherd, and if you know anything about sheep herding, has a voice. Has a voice that the sheep recognize that's unique. That when they hear another shepherd talking, they don't follow that shepherd because they know that voice of their shepherd. My friends, you have a good shepherd. You know his voice. You know when he speaks to you amid all of the the chaos that you might be going through in your life, you have the sure word of God in your life. Your shepherd speaks to you. He calls you his little flock, beautiful. You have a shepherd that says you have nothing to fear about when you're under my care. 
And you have the kingdom. You have the kingdom. I just finished reading um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis to my kids. Anybody read it? Watch the movies? Yeah, cool. It's good. If you have kids, grandkids that are around the age of six or older, now's the time to start reading that book to them because there are huge overtone, undertones of the gospel and redemption and all of these neat themes that really cause great conversations if you, if you have family devotions at home. And you can read that story. And spoiler alert for these people that haven't heard it, First of all, spoiler alert, it's been like 50 years. Come on now, I can't really spoil it after 50 years. You've had your chance. The kids, four kids, they're, travel, uh, they're on vacation at professor's house. They run, playing hide and seek into a wardrobe. Actually, I think they're running away from somebody coming down the hall, some grownups. And they run into the wardrobe. And long story short, they all get in there eventually. And, they, and it's, it's cold. It's winter, but it's never what? Christmas. Horrors for kids, right? Winter, but never Christmas. This is the worst world ever. Well, it was all the cause of a white witch who had put a curse on the land, and she's really evil, really bad. She wants to even do away with these kids that are coming into her dominion until the snow starts melting. Because who's in town? Aslan, the lion. He's coming in and everything starts melting down. Oh, and the kids love this part. There's even Christmas, you know, Father Christmas comes and they start celebrating again. Long story short, the witch is defeated. Aslan gives his life as a redemption for a traitor. And, um, and the witch is defeated at the end, the very last chapter called the White Stag. The, there's, there they are, the kids in this great castle that they're gonna be kings and queens in at Ker Paravel. And they're seated on the four thrones, just like the prophecies that have said that there would be. And there were kids, just kids, being crowned. And the creatures were saying, long live King Edmund and long live Queen Lucy. And Aslan puts the scepter on their shoulders and crowns them kings and queens. And then he says this, once a king or queen in Narnia, always a king or queen in Narnia. Do you know what that means? That means that they're kids, but they're kings and queens. <laughs> and you know what? They would grow up and they would run and, and, and by chance they went back out of the wardrobe and you know what? They ended up being just the same kids outside of the wardrobe that they were when they entered in. But their identity, that's what we're talking about here. Their identity, once a king or queen in Narnia, always a king or queen in Narnia. Have you forgotten your identity in Jesus? Have you forgotten that you're cared for eternally, that he says, do not fear, that I've given you the kingdom, that you're sons of the Most High, that you're royalty, not because of anything you've done or earned or deserved, but because he gave his life, not on a stone table, but he gave his life on a cross for you. And it was costly and he loves you. And he says, so I want you to be thinking like a king and queen. I want you to be acting like a king and queen because this is the way that I've made you. Don't fear. The kingdom's yours. Once royalty, always royalty. Therefore, because you have that treasure, where's your heart gonna be? Oh, you're gonna want it because you have it. Not that you desire it, like you gotta run out and get it yourself, but you already have it. And that's the best news that you can have. Where your heart is, is where Jesus' treasure has made it. So, put the last things first. Your identity is in your Savior. And second of all, be dressed ready to go at any moment. Be dressed ready to go at every moment. Okay? He keeps on going. I'm sorry, I did want to share this. This is a quote by Martin Luther who speaks to the same thing. Uh, Martin Luther said, I have held many things in my hands and have lost all of them, but whatever I placed in God's hands, that I still possess. All right, let's keep on moving on. Luke 12, uh, starting at verse 35 says, be dressed, ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. 
It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus is talking here about that hour that, that is the last day when he's going to return to take us to be with him. Or if he chooses to take us in death before that day, we need to be ready and we need to be prepared. That's what he says when he says, be dressed ready for service. And I love the uh, old King James version of this. It says, let your loins be girded about. Isn't that great? <laughs> What does that mean? It means be ready to go. In Exodus, um, God told his people, I want you to have this Passover meal and I want you to be ready to go. Eat it fast and, re and with your, um, what is it again? Your loins girded about so that when the angel of death comes over and Egypt sees the presence of God, you can run and you're gonna be free. They were dressed ready to go. Jesus says the same is true for you and me that you and I need to be ready at any moment because like you don't just assume that the thief is going to call you up the week before he robs you and give you the time and date that he's gonna break in. <laughs> Jesus is gonna come back at any moment. It's not for you and me to know. It's not for you and me to know. And that's okay because we're dressed ready to go at any moment in every season. We're dressed ready to serve like a master who's going to a banquet, let's say a rich man today with a huge estate, and you know he gets chauffeured everywhere, and he's coming back late from a really famous wedding that he's at. The servants, they don't shut everything down before and until what? He gets back home, and they make sure everything's right for him as he goes back into his bedroom, and then once he's in bed, puts his head down on the pillow, they all can go to sleep themselves, but they're ready, they're vigilant, because they don't know what hour he's coming back. They don't know how late this famous party is gonna go. That's the picture that Jesus is using here. So, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. My, um, the clothes that I wear for travel, I don't know if any of you do this, you set out your clothes the night before a long trip, especially if you're leaving, like say at three in the morning or four in the morning to get to the airport. This is my traveling clothes. Basically, it's a V-neck shirt, extra soft cotton, golf shorts, especially right now when it's hot, and my Under Armour shoes. Oh, so comfy. And you're probably saying to yourself, but pastor, I came in during a weekday and you were wearing the same thing. Well, I'm always ready for Jesus to come back. That's why I wear that outfit. It's really comfy, especially in hot summer in Texas, okay? I can work better. And I mean, I'm waiting for Jesus' return, and that's why I'm wearing it. But in closing, I'm asking you, think about what you're dressed for, not just your physical dress, but are you dressed ready for his return? Are you dressed with um, anger, with jealousy? resentfulness to that person that hurt you. Is that the way that God dressed you? Are those the clothes that he put out? Kings and queens, always kings and queens? No. He's dressed you in the blood of Jesus and forgiven you to be patient and loving and taking other people's words and actions in the best possible way. That's the way he, when he comes back, he's gonna find you. So put on those clothes. Are you dressed with anxiety about the upcoming school year. It's true, it happens. I mean, I was a student once too. I know it's a huge task in front of you. Are you dressed with worry to the point of, of, of um, almost losing your mind? Just remember, fear not, little flock. I've given you the kingdom. Is your responsibility really just to get grades in school? Or is it to do all things, even get grades to the glory of God? dressed in humility and service with him on your mind, whether you're going to school or whether you're going to work this next week. How about your money? Are you dressed with greed? Fear of losing it? Is your responsibility, is your job as somebody that's ready for the last day to pile up as much money as you can? I think the challenge that Jesus is putting in front of you and me as believers is to be dressed 
not thinking about piling up as much money as we can, but no matter how much money that we have, to be extremely generous with that money. In closing, I'll just tell you the end of this story about that car. My sister is an angel because she and my brother-in-law did not charge me for the repairs. I don't think so. I can't remember clearly and we were texting back and forth this week, but they either paid for like 75% of it or maybe even 100% and I only had to pay just a little bit on this huge bill. That's called grace. And I'll never forget that. that. That is real grace. But you and I never have to worry, am I dressed right? Did I just put on the right clothes? Did I just act right? Did I, did I behave the way prepared for Jesus? Instead of putting your eyes on yourself, put your eyes back on him who did it all. For him who gave you the clothes, washed in your baptism forever, and then wear them. You're prepared. Put the last things first. Amen. Thank you.